there we go. So yeah, so I'm John Park, good afternoon. Um, I am very lucky to be working on this particular project uh, with some really great people. Um, New Jersey Division of Fish and Game is here today. You know, Jimmy Sloan, Andy Burnett, they're in the back. They were part of the partners there. Bob Williams, of course, wrote the plan for the, uh, the project that we're going to be uh, talking about. And, um, and uh, again, Tall Timbers, uh, definitely that's the partner you want to be with when you're talking fire ecology and Bob White Quail uh, uh, restoration and recovery. Let's see. So yeah, so how did Audubon uh, even get involved in this in the first place? Well, we're more, we, I guess we've been the, the oldest conservation organization in this state. I've uh, been around since 1897 and our whole focus is, it started out as the birds, but over the time it kind of morphed into other things, particularly habitat restoration and looking at a lot of different threatened and endangered species. And one of the trends we kept seeing in the state here is that uh, you know, the state, the forest, people don't think of Jersey, it's kind of what, what uh, John Sacco said, as a, as a place that has all these diverse habitats. And, you know, when you look at forest land in particular, 38% um, of the forests in New Jersey are owned by families, okay? Um, the state and the feds, they only have, uh, they only have a small uh, piece of that. So when you're trying to work with, with uh, forestry, and, uh, and it, it really comes down to private landowners and getting some stuff on the, on, the, uh, on the landscape. But when you really take a look at the forest and the state of the forest in New Jersey, something really interesting kind of pops out at you when you look at FIA data and some of the far, uh, age class, is that we're kind of stuck in a, uh, well, you know, this even age, uh, this age class that is really just kind of, we, we don't have a lot of uh, young forest and we don't have a lot of mature forest. We're kind of in that, in that middle age kind of age class. And when you start really you know, looking at things and looking at the trends, one thing we started to, to look at was, oh my God, if the trends keep going the way they're going, uh, we're going to lose out um, in young forest completely um, in a pretty relatively fast time frame. And when you kind of look at the trends when you look at bird data here in Jersey. And by the way, New Jersey is absolutely phenomenal for birds. I mean, we have over 465 species identified in this state, you know, kind of where we are in the landscape, we're right smack in the middle of that flyway, so with a rest area for migratory uh, birds. We have diverse habitats, so we do have a lot of breeding birds. But when you do look at these, these trends, you still have to see trends in songbirds with their kind of going in the same direction as our young forests are. And this is not just Jersey, this is more or less the, the, uh, the Northeast. But we started getting really concerned because um, it wasn't just the young forest birds, it was also your interior forest birds because it turns out the research says if you don't know, a lot of those birds in the interior forest when they nest, um, they bring their young to the young forest and that's where they forage and, and, uh, and get the nutrition and all that other good stuff. And, but we were seeing significant uh, drops in just about everything that we had here in Jersey when it came to uh, early successional species. If you look at the endangered species list in Jersey, for, I think it's 41% or 47% of them are of some kind of uh, early succession, uh, you know, young forest species because we're just losing them. So what do you do about that? Well, uh, Jim kind of brought this up before, uh, when you think about having that buy-in, trying to get people to kind of work with you and do different things. Now, my function at Audubon is to work with a lot of landowners, promoting the NRCS programs and U.S. Fish and Wildlife programs and getting stuff on the ground. Now, Jersey, I don't know if it's anything different than, than uh, other places, um, it is a lot smaller in landscape, so you have a lot of different interest on that land. Some come down to they just care about the tax assessment. It's really all they care about to qualify for farmland or woodland. They, uh, if you're working with farmers, um, God bless them, but there are, are patch sizes to work with in fields, especially trying to get stuff to convert over to grasses or uh, put in buffers. They can't really do a lot, you know? Uh, some folks at lunch, we were talking about this where, you know, if you go to an NRCS program and the minimum is a 35-foot buffer you want to put in, but we're on, I'm only working with a 40-acre a field, no one wants to give up production ground. 
Um, and this is a big problem. Uh, the average farm size in Jersey is only about 80 acres. That's nothing, okay? So we, and the other problem is, God forbid you talk about a threatened and endangered species because in New Jersey, it comes with some regulation and nobody wants that, right? Who does? So what do you pick? What do you do and where do you go to try to get early successional back into the landscape? And there was one species in particular that everybody loves. Everybody loves a quail. It doesn't come with the, with the restrictions, right? It's not a three T and E species. Farmers love it. In fact, when I was growing up here, I, I'm I lived in Jersey my entire born here, raised here. I remember quail back in the 70s and 80s down in the Pine Barrens. That's where I saw my first quail. And the farmers love it, so they had that iconic image in their head that was out on the landscape. You know, the bird watches, they love it, right? Because Nobody gets to see them anymore. Um, just about everybody knows what that quail is. Nobody knows what a prairie warbler is or, you know, a, I don't know, grasshopper sparrow. And they're not, not as cool looking and, and I'm definitely not promoting to a landowner, let's, let's get some timber rattlesnakes on your property. So quail seem to be the thing to really kind of focus on. And as you can see, um, they basically are thought of to be functionally extinct in the state. And what's that mean? Well, Vision Fishing Game did some good studies uh, back in, uh, in 2000 or so, and uh, to get a, an action plan together, it really what came out of it was, it was really kind of put in two different spots. Um, there was an area kind of up in, uh, let's see, kind of up in the Pine Barrens here that could, could handle it, right? and then along the Delaware Bay Shores were two spots that if they were around, they probably were the areas that would be able to actually hold them. But there were some problems with this. Um, as Andy and Jimmy can tell you, there was definitely a lot more releasing of birds that were not wild birds, you know, pen raised birds for hunting and fishing, and the fishing, the hunting and, um, and wildlife management areas and all. So no one really had a good handle on whether or not we had wild birds or not. Um, Division Fishing Game, they started their work down on the Delaware Bay Shores where the last uh, wild quail was known to be and did some phenomenal work. And they can tell you about that later on um, along that area. But we took another approach. We wanted to look more at the forest areas, in particular because we were also seeing these declines in a lot of other different species, not just the birds too, but, but the, the pinelands. So we went, all, we went back and focus in and there's another good reason why the Pinelands is such a good spot to actually do this kind of work. The protections that come with the Pinelands, Bob kind of referred to it before with the Pinelands Commission and why that whole uh, thing was set up and how it works so you definitely have a lot more restrictions on what you can and can't do as far as development goes. Another thing too was the type of management that you could do in the pinelands. There was a lot, there was a lot uh, more uh, readily acceptable, especially when it came to burning, and, and also the forestry work. The one thing that definitely stood out with us was the type of agriculture and land management that was happening in the pinelands as opposed to what's the stuff going on down in the Delaware Bay Shores and other parts of the state. Trying to get, again, farmers in Jersey to kind of go along with a lot of these things is difficult. Sure, you're gonna find some guys, and um, they might like the quail, but again, it's tough, especially when row crop agriculture, to ask those guys to pull stuff out of production. They just won't do it. It really takes a unique individual to give you land to play with, to put back into, into habitat. So, Row crop agriculture, for the most part, is everywhere else but the pinelands. The pinelands have it, but not to the extent that you need that you can alter it or work with a guy to actually get this habitat back up to speed. It's more cranberry production, blueberry production, and forestry. So this was a natural fit, especially when you start thinking about that long-term management, right? All the forestry work that's going in, the work that Bob Williams and other forest and area did, you could do long-term management. So we focused on the Pinelands, in particular, Pine Island Cranberry Company. Pine, that's all Bob's work down there at the bottom there. But Pine Island Cranberry was really unique in that 
They're the largest private landowner in the state, 14,000 acres. That's a big deal in New Jersey, all right? Like I said, that average farm is about 80 acres. 14,000 acres, that's, that's a big chunk. And what was kind of neat too was Bob was already, had already written a plan for Pine Island. I think it was the second one in the state to get approved uh, for the Pinelands, I believe. So they were already doing this kind of work down the line. And when we got the tour of the site, i never forget uh, bringing up uh, Dr. De Theron, uh, Theron uh, Terhune from Tall Timbers up, and we walked the site, and the first thing he said, he goes, oh my God, he goes, this property looks a lot like what we have down south. You know, I mean, up top is, is pictures from, you know, the various states, and down the bottom is Pine Island Cranberry, pretty much looking like the same thing you had in these other spots. They were doing that kind of habitat work already. Partridge pea and you know, uh, uh, you know, clear cuts and grassland, you name it. We, Bob had it all going on already. So more or less, uh, Tall Timber said to us, this is what we've been looking for the whole time. We've been looking for a site in, in the, uh, the, the Northeast where we can try doing direct translocation to compare those results with that of a project we're doing over in Maryland where they're doing parent rearing of birds, okay? There was so many criteria on how to get the birds up here, that's the problem they were having. One was it couldn't be on public land. So unfortunately, a lot of the work, the great work that they were doing at Division of Fish and Game was on public land. So that just booted that out right off the bat. Second thing was they needed long-term management plans in place. Well, we had one in, the, in Bob's plan. Third one was there couldn't be any birds already on site. This, the, more, like, more or less, the birds in the pinelands were extirpated. We knew that possibly there might have been some down in Delaware Bay Shore. And the last one was we had to have quality habitat, at least 1,500 acres prior to any translocation. Like I said, Bob had already been doing this already at Pine Island, so it worked out very nice. So the research project that we wound up getting turned into all this was, can you transfer uh, pop, you know, Bob White's from down south, up here, and would they actually make it, okay? And there's the list of objectives. It really was a big issue here because quite frankly, nobody knew, nobody had tried to bring these up this far into their, into their most northern range and would these things actually make it. The other part of it too is, you know, are they gonna be able to respond to the same kind of stuff that we're doing over here, all right? We wound up hiring uh, University of Delaware. We have uh, two grad students, uh, Phil Coppola, Phil's in the back right by Jimmy and Andy, a uh, doctorate student, and Kylie Stevens is doing her master's. And that's pr pretty much what our project is. Two things we're looking at, you know, obviously the, the evaluation, the efficiency of using the Bob White quail for population study, and then the winter survival rates. On April 1st, 2015, 80, uh, 80 quail were transferred up from, from Georgia. There's uh, Dr. Hewn letting them go over there at Pine Island. But what's really kind of neat about the pines, again, and why we're doing this, is the location. All right, we got Pine Island Cranberry. There's your 14,000 acres. But look what's around it. Now this is what makes it really kind of interesting. Wharton State Forest, all right? We got a gun range, a bombing range here right next to us, private preserves, more state forest land, WMAs. This is an interesting situation because it basically, when you take into account all these areas around it that either have active management, can do active management, or in the process of doing inventory work to perform active management, it comes out to around 220,000 acres with Pine Island in the center which is already established quality habitat and the quail uh, populations as we're moving forward with the releases. All the birds get radio collars. All the birds are, are um, checked on uh, each week. Uh, geez, I don't know what we're up to now, Phil, like three, four days a week uh, out there running around, um, finding out where they go, what they do. Where they're released? On Bob's treatment areas. Different treatment areas he's done, cuts over the last couple years, different age classes that we have going on, different types of uh, areas that get burned. Some get burned one year, others are on a, a different schedule. 
And this is just an example of basically what, what the telemetry points look like when Phil's out there running around, uh, you know, chasing these birds down and where they are and where they go. What came out of all this? Well, that was uh, three years ago. The project was only scheduled for three years of releases. This was the last year of releases. But we had some really cool things happen. Wound up with 240 pair of birds released from, you know, brought up from Georgia, a total of 39 nests. It was the first confirmed nesting of Bob White in the Pinelands since the 80s. Um, 117 chicks were known to hatch. Uh, we had overwintering, no problem. Um, you know, confirmed nest double clutching. I mean, all kinds of great stuff. Here's something though too that also made it really a, an interesting thing was doing the predator surveys. I mean, we'd go out and do surveys for three years and that number, 24%, that's not that high compared to other spots in the state where there was high as I think, Jimmy, what was it? It was it's as high, like Dick's was, might have been 70s or something. I mean, that's different, that's, that's a high number. And, but a lot of that too was also feral cats and everything and, and added into that. We don't have that situation in the Pinelands, all right? It's pretty insulated. Remember too, the type of agriculture we're dealing, cranberries, blueberries, and forestry, right? You're not getting the row crops, you're not getting the, the, uh, uh, the additional uh, rodents and predators that fall into that category. So we basically, you know, are working in a good spot, but we're, and we're having success. By the way, every picture you see up here is all from the, from the study. One thing we didn't uh, kind of factor in, I know Brian Hudson is really gonna love this one, is uh, our snake predation. Well, it turns out too, the pine snakes, hognose snakes, black snakes, black rat snakes, timber rattlers, uh, what else am I leaving out? I mean, it seemed like every snake in the world came out of the woodwork and they love these timber cuts and they love short leaf pine and they love pitch pine and they love being in the same area as the quail. Um, in fact, last year, every single nest we had, we had them on cameras last year for the first time, um, basically got predated uh, by pine snakes. There's a pine snake right there. That's, that's one of the camera shots and the nest was there. They also, uh, they also like quail. Uh, that's, uh, that's Phil. There's a bird and a transmitter in there and that's the telemetry that's over the top of the snake. We did recover the transmitter. So, but you know what? I'm the only one that really gets excited about this for, um, for the overall initiative. If you talk to my quail colleagues, they have a heart attack every year when I have to report on how many made it and how many got eaten by snakes. Because pine snake is a, a, a threatened species in New Jersey. And when I walk through these, the site, that's Pine Island, is one of Bob's cuts on one side and one that's untreated. I am amazed at the diversity that is through this site. I say this a lot, and I know a lot of you guys have even heard me say this, I see things at this site that I've only seen in books about the Pine Barrens. And it's not just one rare plant, it's a gazillion of them. And when you burn the property, like we, we did one burn this year in a particular spot that hadn't been burned in a while, it was a plethora of Pinelands uh, listed plants, endangered plants, the endangered species. It was incredible. It's such an amazing situation to see all this because quite frankly, you know, again, leading up to this point, forestry wasn't happening all the time. It was a lot of private stuff where the state would do just enough because they were handcuffed too on what they could and can't do. And the state guys have it even worse because the public gets to comment and that ain't fun because a lot of it they don't understand what goes into all of this and what you can get out with a little bit of management. With all those different species that we saw up there, and again, by the way, all those species were taken on Pine Island, those photographs and what we have in there. Um, we also started adding in, Phil's doing a songbird survey. Because it, you did have to look at these complementary species that were, they were going along with the quail work that was going so well. And guess what? Turns out, songbirds love cuts too and prairie warblers and pine warblers and all the other stuff that's in there, they've also increased over the last, last three years. Highlights of this year, we had 50 successful hatchings. You know, that's, that's pretty good, all right? Given that the species wasn't even around in the state three years ago, okay? 
Oh, and I'd, le I'd left something out. So, pretty important too. We did get an approval for a fourth year release, okay? Because of two things. The project success, how it's moving forward, and the momentum it is gaining because we have guys, we get calls every year now from landowners and farmers and, and foresters saying, how else can we work this because they want quail? Okay, let's think about this. Let's work on your habitat first. And you know what? They're glad to do it because it doesn't come with that stigma of it's a teeny species or regulatory work. But all those other species benefit. Nothing that we don't already know. But here's the really kicker that I love. I, I, I love Division of Fish and Game for this. Jimmy and Andy did something really cool. Because last year, they went and met with our NRCS. Now, I don't know how the hell they did it, but they got New Jersey funding from NRCS for the Working Lands for Wildlife uh, program. Now, Working Lands for Wildlife, we had funding already through NRCS for bog turtle and golden wing warbler, which are, you know, they're the staples here. They were able to show that there was this interest in land management and the fact that we, were, we had a project on the ground that was showing good results and the state was doing additional work down in, in Cumberland that NRCS basically gave New Jersey a portion of those funds to continue with habitat management, but in the pine savanna. So more or less what happened here, guys, is that we wound up with a pot of money that we can give to those landowners that never had that money before. You can get it to equip or, or something else, but this was spe very specific for quail management, but you can include in that short leaf pine, all right, doing controlled burns. All those things that might not be able to be done on a property or they never even thought about until this initiative. And I, I love the fact that they got this and I, and I really got to congratulate Division of Fish and Game for doing this because the other states that got the money, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, the Carolinas, they actually have a quail population. Right now I got whatever's showing up at Pine Island Cranberry, which you'll see tomorrow. So that's a big deal. When they put this out towards the, uh, into the public to see who would want it, they got way more applications they could even handle. In fact, they tapped out and now that things are on our waiting list. What we're hoping now is for next year, hopefully there'll be funding to come back around again. But it showed that there was a need. So, things are good in quail land at Pine Island. Tomorrow you're gonna actually, uh, from what I understand, go to the site. Bob, I have a landowner that is very picky on who gets on that property. And I don't dare to even ask him if I could bring a busload of people onto it in the middle of cranberry harvest. I left that up to Bob. Bob got permission because he knows the guy longer than I do. So tomorrow, enjoy yourselves, ask some questions. I believe Phil, and I know Jimmy and Andy will probably be out on that trip, Bob of course, and uh, hopefully you guys get to see a quail tomorrow. Any questions? Excellent. Yeah, we've got time for a question. Nope, all good. Okay, thanks Mike. Thank you.